you're listening to or watching Strangers in Space. And for the next, I don't know, 45 minutes, knowing us an hour and 45 minutes, we are going to be talking about the Halloween apocalypse so you don't have to. Hi, I'm JR. Hello, I'm Lee. Hi, I'm Matt. And I'm Simon. I wondered what you were doing there, Matt, but you were making sure you didn't step all over Lee. Is that right? Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> it would have been fine. <laughs> you I step don't think over me. you're quite big. I don't soft, think... un- soft underfoot. I don't think we would have had any complaints. Mm. Actually, before we talk about the Halloween apocalypse, we had a notice on YouTube. Would you like to? Uh... Have you seen this, Matt? Does it say take this video down? It infringes our nudity policy. It says oh. it's from Comedy Fish, and it says, first off, you guys all look great." Then dot dot dot, and then, but I'm always surprised at how grey Matt is, but still look great. To reiterate, so he's a little bit worried that you might think it was uh, <laughs> just him being rude for the sake of being rude. He thinks this he looks beard, great. This beard <laughs> and. Uh, and Matt's the one who's Does great. he mean the hair or just the general? Because I've got halogen <laughs> lights or something. That might not be quite as warm as... Well. I did tell him that our nickname for you is Cyber oh. Matt, and I implied that that was the reason why. And actually, one of the pictures in the old days was you of Lurch, wasn't it? Yes, it's still there. Yeah, so there you are. Pretty great. <laughs> hey, Matt's trying to give himself some colour. This is gold. <clears throat> for the people listening on the audio podcast, right? We are here to talk about the Halloween apocalypse in a nutshell, people. In a nutshell, I'm going to go around in a circle and just say, did you enjoy it or did you not enjoy it? How much did you enjoy it? Lee, how much did you enjoy it or not? I enjoyed it a lot. Oh, did you? Matt, did you enjoy it or not? I enjoyed it a fair amount. Oh, wow. Simon, did you enjoy it or not? I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I would. Why did oh, okay then. All right. I enjoyed it the least of the four of us then, I think. But that doesn't mean to say I didn't enjoy it. Let's get into what Simon said. You enjoyed it more than you expected to enjoy it. So would you like to elaborate on that? On two Why, levels. Yeah. On yeah. on one level, I was in a dreadfully bad mood <clears throat> this weekend. I couldn't oh, okay. tell you why. And on another level, um, I think I didn't want my expectations dashed. So I gave myself a very low bar to expect. You know, it's that thing of you see the the trailer was very action packed and full of lovely little snippets. And of course, sometimes, as we all know, some Hollywood movies in particular don't live up to that. You know, where you've got lots of very... um, action-based shallow action doesn't necessarily mean that the whole thing's going to knit together very well so in that respect i wasn't necessarily expecting something as good as i got we didn't everything that we got was very open-ended and he introduced a lot of strands so there's going to be a lot of plates spinning i suspect given that next week is the sontaran story the one with the sontarans whatever lee's making out like he didn't know like you didn't know, Lee. I didn't know. Okay. But didn't you watch till the after the credits? No, I don't do that, do I? But it's okay. Oh, well, it's a, we're on a podcast have, talking about, it, so I, I'm, you know, I, you yeah. should have watched till after the credits, then, Lee, because it would well, have been much nicer to find out with the trailer than to find out from me. But what you what you've said is is quite nice because it mean it reiterates something that I was thinking was going to happen anyway. I think it does look like potentially. <laughs> What might happen now is that we spend an episode in each one of these storylines, potentially with the other storylines going on in the background in the episode, but with each episode concentrating slightly more on each of these things. We'll have to see if that's how it transpires, but it looks like that might be the case. So what I propose to do now is have a little chat about the episode in general, about the tone and feel of it, and then just go through the various different elements and say what we think of those, because there are so many elements we We can't do the conversation without splitting it up like that. For myself, it didn't, it wasn't as amusing or as engaging as a Stephen Moffat episode would have been for me, being a Stephen Moffat fan. And I suspect for at least two of you, that's probably also the case. Having said that, I was engaged throughout. I never, my interest never flagged and it was 50 minutes. 
And it was 50 minutes kind of in search of a plot, because let's be honest, in that 50 minutes, right up until about 10 minutes from the end, nothing actually really happened. There was just an awful lot of running around, not really achieving very much, apart from getting the gang together, as it were, or even not getting the gang together in the case of, say, Vinder, because he's yet to meet the Doctor, as have many of the others. So there's a lot of running around, not getting the gang together in that case. So I don't think it really achieved anything. And I think I was very much aware that it wasn't really achieving anything for a lot of the running time. So I think my enjoyment was based upon, well, did it make me laugh? Did it keep me engaged? And in the former case, not really, although it was trying. And in the latter case, yes, it did. I'll go into that maybe in a little while more, Lee. I think there's still problems with the direction, the production of this phase of Doctor Who. That means it's not as light on its feet as it has been in the past. And I think that's still a bit of an issue for me. So, I mean, Matt, I'll come to you first, because you're usually the one who's generally a bit more up to talking about the plot and whether it works and such. I mean, yes, this is the first of six episodes. So this is basically introducing the stories that we're going to watch. In fact, somebody said on Facebook somewhere, I think it was John Arnold, may not have been John Arnold, might have been Paul Driscoll, said it just felt like a trailer for the rest of the season, a 50 minute trailer for what's to come. And I've got to say, in retrospect, I think that's probably right. It did feel a bit like a trailer because it was just introducing lots of elements. So, Matt, you say, and slightly less than Simon or Lee, I think you enjoyed it. But is that fair to say that for you, it just it felt like a lot of plates spinning, but none of them actually really doing anything? Um, No, I think I defend it against that. I think it's doing multiple things. It's certainly setting up, as you say, elements, major elements for future episodes. So Weeping Angels, Sontarans, Binder, blah, blah, blah. All of these are obviously going to be returned to. All of these are potential launch pads for individual stories. So that's one thing it does. It sets up mysteries. So I'm really happy that the division is back being mentioned, which means the timeless children hasn't been dropped, we'll which come is one to that of my fears. Again. So it sets, up, <laughs> it sets up a lot of a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, but I think it also did have a plot. And you said it was just getting the gang together. I think that was a plot. It was a it was a rescue movie. Uh, so yeah, the whole point of the plot yeah, was yeah. The, the dog, the dog monster and his motivations and why he's got Dan and how they get Dan out. I mean, it wasn't like a 50 minute Doctor Who episode plot. No. But it didn't have to be. I think it well, was, no, that it was, was really nicely spread out. And I did I did actually think that was, I found that more satisfying than a lot of the comments I've read, I think. Really? Um, so, yeah, I think I think it did a lot of things quite adroitly and and it was well balanced for me. That's I could see exactly cool. what it's doing. But again, as you say, as as episode one, unlike any other any other episode in the the modern Doctor Who series, this is the hardest to judge on its own because any, they could do it. If he ties it all together and takes all of these elements and threads them through the threads them through the swarm story and the flux story, which I assume he will do, and he ingeniously like brings in the secrets and ties those through the flux story, then it's it's going to be a really strong six part overall story. If he doesn't, and it just becomes an epi- a Sontaran episode and a Weeping Angel episode mm. that happens to occasionally mention the flux going on in the future, then I'll be slightly less enamoured with the whole thing. Well, I think, yeah, Chris Chibnall, generally speaking, is quite good at pulling the things together at the end, whether it's to your satisfaction or not as an individual viewer you know that that's a subjective opinion but generally speaking chris chibnall is quite good at tying the things together when he needs to we'll see i would suggest that if you were eight or ten if you were a child watching this this would probably be one of the most exciting doctor who episodes ever with all these storylines going on and all these people and things turning up dog people the face people i don't know what was that luvari or lumari or something 
whatever they were called, the, the guy Swarm and his sister Azure, whatever. Hmm. Yeah, with all these creatures turning up, fantastic if you're 10 or 8. So Lee, what did you think? Not that I'm making an allusion there or anything. Yeah, the voice of the 10 year old. <laughs> the 10 year old inside me love this. Um, uh, there's a lot going on in this, which I'm sure we'll cover. So it's quite hard to kind of squeeze it into a bit of a nutshell, to be honest. But I mean, what we what we're looking at is exactly what you've all said already, which is <clears throat> a preemptive strike of five other episodes that will have, um, you know, each of the elements that we've already seen in them as the main driver of a, of a narrative or story with the flux happening around all the swarm popping up and everyone I didn't know they were called the Swarm, but I know they're called the Swarm. No, now. his name, his name is Swarm, the lead one of them. Uh, okay. Um, the, the species. Did they say the species? No, I'm thinking of the species that they talked about. Um, Carvanista, aren't I? So I'm yeah. getting that mixed up. They didn't say um, the species, did they? But nice to, I, have a nice to have a villain villain again, um, as opposed to technology gone wrong and all that sort of stuff. So I think that's what we've been missing. Nice to have a comedy element um, in it you know a comedy character which is the dog but he's not really massively funny he just looks like a dog right um, and the you know i think that the cast are really strong all the cast are really strong in this everybody was great and i strangely felt i don't know how to say this really because i've never said this before but i actually felt that the doctor was the weakest part of this um and i don't know whether i don't think it's i don't know whether it's because jody's being directed wrong again i don't know all the the script or the words just sometimes the way she says things they, they don't have the power that's needed the very last lines about the universe ending should have you should have we should have been not listening to the rest of the world going on and actually heard what she said and seen that in her eyes shit it's the end of the universe guys it's the end not oh i wonder what, i've always wondered what that felt like it's like oh. there's 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 always that missing in the chidna episodes that kind of depth of honesty and sincerity in what you're saying in, in the lines. She made a choice when she started to play the whole thing with that same breathlessness as Peter Davison did. And I think that stands against her because she very rarely settles down and gives anything the weight that you get with stillness. Wait. And so, yeah, there's no weight or stillness. Occasionally she'll do a bit. She did it in the two Dalek episodes. She had moments with weight and stillness, but she always plays it. You know, she played the whole of this episode breathless in that Peter Davison way. And you're right. I think that undermines the import of what's going on. Having said that, that last line, if if she had treated it like the end of the universe, that's what you would have expected. For the doctor to deliver a line about the end of the universe in a way that you don't expect. That's exactly what you'd want from Doctor Who. You don't Not when it's a cliffhanger, though, Matt. Oh, Imagine the, the, every yeah, but the the cliffhanger is pretty much supported by the visuals of what's going on and the music. So the doctor delivering a line like it's oh wow look at this that you don't need her to to go like Tom Baker Doom on it. You can Tom, have Tom a Baker wouldn't do though, Tom Baker wouldn't do necessarily Doom would he? He'd just really? look into he the did, camera he, and he he'd drop doom. his face. He did Doom with a closed door and a lighthouse. Yeah. Yeah, but he would drop his. You know, you could put this with. You could give this to any doctor, and for some some reason, I would believe them all. But with that line at that time, with that piece of choice of acting or directorial, you know, moment, yeah. it didn't feel right to me. I and think it, it was partly, a big moment. Uh, yeah, and I think it's partly to do with the sound mix and to do with the camera choices. Yeah, because here's a slight example of what I was saying about the comedy not landing. She says the universe is about to end. So I'm going to do what I always do. I'm going to go to Earth. And both the companions go, what? And that should have been a really funny moment. But the only way that moment works as a funny moment is if the camera cuts to the two companions. And we get a close up of the two of them doing the double take together. And that's what gives the moment its comedy because it's a moment of character comedy. But instead, you stay in the medium to long shot. And the reaction of the two of them is so far in the background, you can't really see it. So that entire moment of comedy falls flat. And now I'm not saying the problem with this episode, and I don't think it's a massive problem. I think it was basically a pretty good episode, really. But it didn't quite hit home. And I'm not saying the problem with this episode is that that moment of comedy didn't land. But I'm saying that moment of comedy not landing is an example of the thing that's going throughout the whole of the era where 
there are lots of nice pretty pictures and there's lots of nice pretty music and there's lots of nice pretty actors but none of them seem to be on the same page as far as driving drama is concerned and i think we've had this problem from the start from those early episodes where everything was over explained to the music being kind of monotonous and one note and in this episode lots of camera choices which fail to emphasize the characters when we had all those um bits with Carvanista. Some of them were really nice and some of them were really funny. And then sometimes his funny moments were in the background of shots where you really wanted to see a bit more of him or you wanted to see a bit more of Dan. And I don't know whether it's just maybe that's a result of the COVID shooting that they weren't quite able to get all of the coverage that sometimes they may have got. But I, it's a problem that's been around for the whole of this era, really. And I think it slightly undermines it because I think the stories of generally speaking been better than their on-screen reputation anyway at the risk of waffling on simon a bit more in depth but i mean how does all this how how did the whole of the sort of bang 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 one thing to another did it all work for you as a sort of coherent whole bearing in mind that it is still an introduction uh, put it this way I, I thought it worked as a ride um <clears throat> because it, it felt like the pacing of the episode it was finally almost like keeping up with jody with how she delivers, because it is all very snappy, and um, you know where she talks to her, has these conversations with herself, and she's throwing tidbits to herself and trying to work out the problem. And it felt like the pacing of the of the the show was doing the same as her. So suddenly, it felt for me like, oh, this is what Jodie's Doctor Who should be like. You know, she does those quiet moments that we've seen in other programs. She does those quiet emotional moments beautifully. So there's no problem with her, you know, doing the emotional card. I, I still don't think she's really been given the material to do that. And I hate that criticism because that was something that was fired at Peter Capaldi all the time, which was complete tosh. Um, so I hope I'm not talking complete tosh. But there's that. But also, I think a massive thing was the fact that we're down to just Jodie and Yaz. And I think that works brilliantly. And I think that we've got those two magic numbers is i think the doctor works you know with with one companion or two and i think anything more you start diluting the, um some of the uh communication and and the beautiful dialogue i mean the, the frustrating thing with this and, and this is where i'm with you jr is that we are missing the moffat dialogue big star and probably rtd dialogue big style as well it really it, it doesn't hit home the comedy doesn't hit home um, i think there is but this some was, good dialogue what, here but i just don't think it really feels like it's being delivered yeah yeah i mean what what i will say about this episode is i think it's the nearest that christian was done to another dinosaurs on a spaceship hmm. because it was mad and it had the imagination um and even um sigun uh, agonola seems to have had to step up and and finally do some proper symphonic stuff which i i know it's we it shouldn't we shouldn't expect that all the time but there was a definite need for him and i think he stepped up to it i don't yeah, it was i couldn't at this time. I, it was certainly i mean i don't think there was any kind of thematic stuff that we can pick up on in the same way as we would murray gold but that that's not necessarily you know that's not necessarily the job of somebody who's doing a score the score has got to be there to build the drama and to get everything whirring and, and ticking over and it did so i think um it, it's like we we're watching the ripples this idea of seeding all these characters who like lee said i think will each episode will possibly focus on one of these disparate supposedly disparate things i mean I, I, we'll have to come up with the name of this kind of format you know it's almost like the base under siege but we've got these kind of inverted ripples that are coming out from the outside coming together at the end and, and that is almost another, another new format of Doctor Who that I think we've seen before. I can't think of an episode as, as such. Possibly have seen movies like it. Um, this big idea that there are all these supposedly disconnected things that will all, we, we know will connect at the end. The closest um, that we've had to this is the first episode of Series 6, which would be the American one, uh, The Impossible Astronaut. Yeah. Because yeah. some of that is set in the 60s. Some of it's set in the modern day. And there are lots of things going on and you don't get to find out why 
in that mm. first episode you have to come back the next week mm. matt wanted to say something oh only that i found it funnier than any other chipnall script possibly yeah. because of well, delivery yeah. i think john bishop was great when with the oh yeah he was the gag about the shrinking Definitely. house i like the dog monster and all the humor around the dog monster and the motivation of the dog monster so i laughed in this episode which i haven't really done in a in a chipmill script for for years and that helped no end that made, that made me feel a lot more at home when he had the it dog in his yeah. kitchen that was a that was a funny moment wasn't it but you, yeah. you could tell oh, that they were allowing the face yeah yeah it worked really well they're allowing him to do his comedy shops which is that, what they should do yeah that's what i was thinking whether some of those lines were john bishop based um there may have been a moment where chibnall i would i would have done that i would have said listen mate do you want to just ad lib a bit and see what happens you know here's the rough idea and then to do what you want to do i don't know whether he's following the exact script or whether he's doing his own thing but he felt very natural didn't he i mean he he felt like and i think that's the thing everybody's acting and it was really on a level but with John Bishop, I was almost expecting him not to be the, a better actor, you know, a good actor. I thought, well, he's a comedian. Can he act? I don't know. Um, but actually, it was it was really lovely. It was very, very natural and very Liverpudlian, very, very him. And um, and they didn't squash any of that out. They just let him bloom. And I, I think he's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. He had made an interesting doctor. He was, he was better than uh, Bradley Walsh. Me. Do you think so? I was yeah. going to steer the conversation towards Dan so we could talk about him last, given that he's the new companion. So that's what we should. But we're there. So let's do it. Go on yeah. then, Matt. De- why do you think he was better? Than well, just, well, just on I... the basis, just on the basis of this episode, I believed a lot of what he was saying. And I think that, as Lee said, the comedy came quite naturally out of him. I didn't feel like he was doing a dramatic moment and then a comedic moment. With Bradley Bosch, I always felt like so uh, the thing I always remember is in uh, not Spy Hard. What was it called? The Spyfall. <laughs> Spyfall Part Two, where Bradley Walsh has laser shoes, which is a great, a great idea. But Spyfall Part Two was Spyfaller, wasn't it? But the yeah. delivery, the delivery of the joke about laser shoes just fell completely flat for me. Just like mine, just there, yeah, about Spyfaller. And- I'll repeat think, it just in case you missed it. I think there was nothing there was nothing in this episode that fell flat like that. It all kind of worked for me. Simon, what did you think of? Did what did you the way they say his character up and most of the reaction I've seen online to this episode has been positive actually. I've not seen an awful lot of negative reaction. And nobody I when he came in and they made him somebody who works in a soup kitchen and doesn't even bring any food home for himself. I thought, oh, there'll be complaints from people because people will be saying, oh, they've made him into such a saint. Why did they make him such a saint? And I'm thinking, well, why would the doctor pick him up if he's not a saint? You know, that's kind of what you want from a companion, isn't it? Surely Mm. the companion should be a saint. But I didn't see any of that complaint. But Simon, what do you think of the character he's playing? I think it's great. I think he's a very warm character. I think that's what you get from it, is that he's very selfless. Um, I would have liked to have seen some food in his cupboard because I don't think anyone literally has an, a bare, an empty cupboard, do they? No, there was something in brilliant. the corner, yeah. Oh, was there? The, best, the yeah. best part of that scene, just very quickly, was when he opened the cupboard and there were a few strands of spaghetti. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> I've been there. I know that cupboard. Anyway, you carry on. You just run it under the hot tap. <laughs> like that. Just stick it in the kettle. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I just did some physical humour. Sorry, audio people. Um, yeah, tenuous. Um, the follow-up to Spyfall was Sphincter, wasn't it? Sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, I really liked the character. I thought it was very warm. I thought it was very, uh, quite, quite believable. I don't know. I don't know. That whole thing of him doing tours and he's not supposed to was I saw the joke coming a mile off. But um, but then it kind of it balanced out with the fact that, he, you know, he was going to start a relationship with somebody who worked at the museum. So I quite like that as well. Um, so, yeah, it, it was just a very warm, warm character. I mean, he seemed to take the space in his stride. But that was quite nice. Um, what was the comment he made when he, when he came in the TARDIS? Oh, he said, I've got one that's bigger. That's right. No, my, mate, mate, had, my mate had yeah. one of these. Oh, sorry. Joke's not technically yeah. correct. Sorry. Right. Okay. No, no, I think that's a, um, that's a Liverpool. It's a, like a Liverpool joke. 
I didn't get it actually. What is, what Chris Chibnall mean, yeah. from Liverpool, of course. Um, I think I think a lot of this I think a lot of this season is going to rely on having a nostalgic regard and a fondness for Liverpool, which I'm a little bit worried about because when I went to Liverpool, the one time I've been for, to Liverpool, I really didn't like it as a city. Wow, that's and lost I'm sure it's, all of I'm 20 sure views. I'm sure it's lovely um, if you grow up there and live there, but it's a pretty miserable place. Hey, it's not that bad. <laughs> and for, oh. It's lovely. And for any viewers who'd like to get in touch, that's wow. Matt Barber at <laughs> yeah. Devil's End. But I didn't vote Tory, so I'm all right. <laughs> Mostly. <laughs> and you don't read the sun? <laughs> yeah, no. No, I don't read the sun. Right, I'm going to move things along a bit because we've got a lot to get through. Um, I will say oh, one can more I thing. just say, oh, can I say one thing? Yeah, the TARDIS on. looked great. The the idea of the, the a liquid TARDIS, it was almost like the way it was shot and the way it was lit and the fact that it was morphing and changing all the time. I thought, oh, this is how it should have been all the way. It was almost like it was made of lava. I tell you what that was, was my really impression. Interesting. I wonder if you put that bed in there to uh, give the uh, people who are shipping Yaz and the doctor something yeah. to uh, ship about. I've seen that suggested several times, yeah, yeah. several times on Twitter. I mean, the obvious thing is the reason why they put a bed under the trampoline is if they're going to put a trampoline there for them to land on in instances where this sort of thing happens, then surely they need to put something next to their trampoline for them to bounce off onto. So that's the reason why the bed's there, because you bounce off the trampoline and land on the bed. That's kind of the whole point of it. But obviously, by making it a bed that he puts there, that's going to give people plenty to talk about, isn't it? Yeah, but me and Simon have slept in the same bed, haven't we, mate? Did oh. we? No, I don't remember, actually. <laughs> I'm sure we did. No, si- it's, it's Simon. <laughs> that it was after Simon had that drink that you made him. Oh, and what? Then, on, on a stag night? He, that's right. Yeah, yeah. No, we were in the same bedroom. Days. Bedroom? Bed? Can't remember now. I don't know. Simon's reaction to Lee's statement there has been like the silence of the lamb. <laughs> where's, where's, where's your hand? It's between two pillows. Two pillows. <laughs> Those are pillows. Good film. Oh my God, that <laughs> takes me back to Lee's thing about Sphincter being the thing at the back. If Sphincter's the thing at the back, then the thing at the front, surely, is Cajonas of Solace. <laughs> Let's move on. I was a bit worried watching this. I don't do. Do any of you ever see any of EastEnders or Coronation Street or? No, Doctor I don't waste or... my minutes of my life on those. I try not to. No. Well, I'm not asking you if you watch them. I'm asking you if you ever see any of them because I don't watch any of those programs. But sometimes they'll be on in the house, and I've got to say, since COVID, since they started making it after the break at the start of the first lockdown, with those programs because they're made in such a hurry. It is really, really patently obvious that the actors are not allowed to be within 10 feet of each other. So they'll have people who ostensibly, according to the stories, live together or work together. And the closest they will ever be on set is at the opposite end of the room from each other. And so throughout the whole thing, they're desperately looking for camera angles where they can get them both in the same shot. And when they do, they film it in such shallow focus that one of them will be, you know, all these tricks to try and make it not look like they're filming under COVID restrictions. Does it, does it look yet, like the scenes of Lord of the Rings when it's Gandalf and the Hobbits? Is it like Oh, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. The point I'm making is I was worried, given that this entire series was filmed under a certain amount of COVID restrictions, that some of that might bleed through. Because whenever I've seen any of those things, whenever I've seen a couple of minutes of Korra or whatever, it's paid so patently obvious that it takes you right out. You can't believe in the characters. You can't suspend your disbelief because all you're doing is looking at the screen and thinking you're 10 feet away from each other and you shouldn't be. I was wondering if any of this series of Doctor Who would throw me out because of that. But there was absolutely nothing in this episode. And it didn't even strike me about that until afterwards when I thought, oh, was there anything? And then I'm thinking back and, you know, the scenes in the museum where you've got like a dozen people or eight eight or ten extras or something walking through the museum and it didn't feel like there was any um restrictions going on there so whatever they whatever they've done however they've done it i think they disguised it really well and maybe we won't have any foreign filming and maybe we won't have too many episodes where there are too many extras but 
for that, for the first episode, for 50 minutes at breakneck speed for a lot of it, not once did I really stop and think, oh, that's because they made this during COVID. So I don't know, did that, I, I, does anybody want to add anything to that? Or is guess, that just... I guess they had a lot more money per episode. Yeah, And sure. also it's a limited series. So actors were able to bubble together, which helps. And actually there were there were a lot of sort of two person conversations or limited conversations but they kind of made them work to their advantage or if that is if they are forced to do it well they always have yeah it's not a bad thing i think no Um, i mean there's always a lot of that in doctor who anyway so it's hard to tell where what would have happened stopped and where what had to happen started really wasn't it right i'm going to throw out some names there is a lot of stuff to get through as i keep saying so i'm going to throw out the name of a character or the name of a a, a species or whatever and we'll just have a couple of minutes on each of those things so carvanista what did everybody think of the dog creature matt what did you think you you said i really know it was one of my he was one of my favorite things in the the program i mean i didn't mind the way he looked i thought he was a bit muffled at times but again, I kind of didn't mind that either because it added to his sort of blustery personality. Um, I liked the northern accent um, because that suited, again, that suited his his personality. And, and also, I really, um, just on that point, I've seen it suggested somewhere that the reason he has a northern accent is because he's been paired with a northern human. Well, so there's possibly a in-universe reason for that. I don't think so, but it's yeah. been suggested. I suspect anybody from Liverpool thinking that somebody with a what a, a Sheffield accent is a well, is it's a, a good, Lancaster. Is a good, accent. yeah, but even then, it's not a good a good pairing. If you had a Liverpudlian accent, then that would work. Um, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I like the concept of the pairing. I thought that was good. Um, was I nice. didn't. I thought there was a big. I didn't quite reconcile the the um, Thor Ragnarok opening where he's trying to kill the Doctor and Yaz above acid with the later represent i mean he's he shit the twist in his role and in his personality also kind of goes against those yeah. scenes yeah. but i can sort of forgive it because it was quite a funny opening and it did sort of kick it off quite well so yeah right. it was good matt's taken up the entire two minutes so we're going to move on <laughs> no did ev- all right a quick thumbs up or thumbs down and let's have it orally rather than visually Lee, Carvinista, good or bad for you? I saw yeah, that good. written on the wall. Yeah, no, good. Yeah, really good. I, I love this character. Northern accent, fine. The makeup, you know, all the, all the whatever you call it, that he had on his face was really good. Yeah, uh, could, so. it could have been, it's called, been bad. It's called hair, Lee. It's what people, <laughs> what people used to have on top of their head before oh, they get wait. older. Luckily, the audio people can't see my flowing locks of pirate hair. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, he was great and funny and... You know, I, what I really loved was his weapon. His weapon turns into a tiny little crate prison, which <laughs> just cracked me right up. But um, yeah, no, he's, he's, oh, yeah. he's good. The pairing idea is a great idea. And the fact that there were billions of ships turning up, which initially when the doctor said, I thought, oh, not billions again. But actually it made perfect sense, you know, eventually, because they have to pair with every human on the on the planet. And that was well, when she said that made sense. Seven- when she said there are seven billion ships, my first thought was, oh, that's the same number as there are of people. But it didn't even strike me that that was why there were seven billion ships. No. Simon, that, that's why you're good in a, that's why you're good determined in a to repeat everything that Matt just said. So, Simon, Carvin. He didn't say anything about the weapon, did he? Yeah. I Mr. Love Gray the, um, in the corner. <laughs> I, uh, initially, I was a little bit lukewarm about him, but he, I, I warmed to him when I realised that he was actually just a bit useless at trying to do something good so i I like that and i also like the design of his weirdly away from the mask i like the design of his suit i thought there's some lovely stuff going on there yeah you're right the way he had this good thing to do but he really didn't care about the good thing other than that he had to do it was brilliant my my brother my brother described him as the doctor's pedigree chum by the way (laughs) i thought i'd share (laughs) share that with you what a wonderful joke Sontarans, what did anybody think about the? I mean, we'll talk about the Sontarans more, I guess, next time. And John, Dan Starkey managed to. Uh, I, yeah, I, I really, really, I, I'm completely won over by the new design, new, inverted commas, new design. Initially, I wasn't very impressed. I don't tend to like backtracking on things. 
and, it, it, and the, the design initially made me feel like they were kind of backtracking and and uh, it was a bit of fan service but actually it's a really lovely blend of the new and the old and getting Dan Starkey in who who had also added a nuance to his performance as well to make it slightly more and I thought in a funny way they were funnier than they were in the Moffat era because yes. they're playing it straight and they're, do- they're, they're playing it straight Sontarans they- are being Sontarans the, the interaction between the two of them was fantastic. I thought. Yeah, it was just that good. one scene, but I loved it. It was so slyly witty, I thought. Yeah. Lee? I'm hoping to see the Rutans. There better be Rutans in the next episode. That's... Oh, I was uh, I was much relieved by the Sontarans because they didn't go full Zack Snyder on them. They kind of made them look a bit more realistic, but they still had the same... Sontar and jokes they were still kind of comic which was yeah I was I was really glad about that sorry could you explain what Zack Snydering means Being uh, Zack take, Snyder. uh, taking away any jokes and just turning them into cloned killing machines you know me um, and my dark DC you know how much I loathe it <laughs> all that stuff what did we think of Dan's potential girlfriend the girl he was trying to get on the date with and what did we, th- what did we, th- I mean, as an actress, she was great. I really enjoyed that relationship. The bit at the end where she goes into the house, she kind of gets taken into the house and Swarm's sister is there and she says, oh, we are going to have fun with you. Is that going to be a story point where for some reason Dan becomes important? And so the people around Dan become important by default. I mean, that's got to be more than just coincidence, hasn't it? So she works at the museum, yeah, mm. as a museum guide. So she knows about the history of Liverpool. So there's something that's to, gonna be? there's something to do with the tunnels in Liverpool, which we saw. Well, so I've I'm... got a sort of slight theory about that, which is okay. that the reason. Well, I think is it about the Daleks because no. they tried to dig a hole somewhere. No, no, no. Those tunnels are real, Lee. That's a real person digging real tunnels. That's a historically accurate bit, and nobody knows why he dug the tunnels. I have a feeling that that is going to be the Weeping Angels episode and that the reason for the tunnels is to draw the Weeping Angels into the tunnels and bury them. I suspect I could be wrong, but that's my theory about the tunnels. So I don't know if that's going to be connected, but obviously it could be. Sorry, Matt, I interrupted. Well, that's uh, that was the the connection that just this second occurred to me, (laughs) that because she knows the history of Liverpool, she might know about the tunnels. And then obviously the swarm or swarm or whatever they're, they're called, they might want to be kind of because obviously the Earth is going to survive the flux because it's surrounded by the dog monster spaceships. So the Earth suddenly becomes this pivotal point in this whole kind of universe, dis, universal disaster. So, yeah, weeping angels, Sontarans, who knows? Potentially, yeah. I, do, I slightly wonder if the whole of the rest of the series might take place in the past in one of those storylines where the idea is to avert the thing that's coming in the future it's just a possibility because we know some of it takes place in the past probably won't turn out to be that i don't know lee simon what did you think of uh, dan's possible girlfriend Uh, the actor and the sort of part we didn't see a great deal of her but i thought it was a nice thing to put in there of course, you immediately you you hope she's going to be all right, so they end up mm. together at the end of the series. So it's um, she's she's part of the momentum, isn't she? I, I assume at some stage they realise she's in trouble and she's got to be rescued. So um, maybe that's him. That's going to be the thing that makes him uh, kind of commit to something. Maybe maybe think of himself as opposed to others. Yes, maybe that could be the reason why he leaves. So he undergoes this story. Where all the and for him maybe the story could be about getting back to this woman, and then at the end of the series that could be why he leaves. It could work that way. I hope mm. it's a happy ending. Wow, well, be nice, wouldn't it? Okay, what did we think of? Oh, and actually, yeah, okay, no, okay, I'm going to go to this one first. Outpost Rose or whatever it's called, and of course Finder. So he's not met the Doctor yet. We know he's going to be one of the regulars through. Lee, you're looking confused. I didn't know that. <laughs> didn't know what. That this Zinder was going to be a companion. 
No, a regular. Oh. I didn't say no, regular. Regular. Okay. regular. I mean, a, a, everybody a, in the yeah, first episode is going to be throughout the series, Lee. Yeah. No, no, that's okay. I'm t- the the idea of, why I'm confused. So the I'm idea of regular becomes a bit meaningless because we know that yes. nobody's going to survive beyond six, possibly nine episodes. Well, they'll, they'll survive, but they won't survive as characters in the series. Mm. Um, and so, obviously, almost everybody who's in this first episode has to turn up later in the series because they've all got open lended storylines at this point, Lee. So, I really liked his character in this. I really liked his his sad kind of storyline, but his uh, his commitment to the job. And it's like I've got to leave my post. I'm, I'm going to die otherwise. Uh, that that was that was all played really well. Apart from yet again, you know, when something's about to hit you and you're about to die, I just like to see a little bit more terror acting or oh my god crap i'm about to die acting but apart from that split second moment i really really liked the character i don't know the actor i don't watch tv so i don't know what he's from but i game thought it was great thrones. it game of thrones which character do you play in that gray worm was that it oh right well there you are I so, that so lee does know who he is i do know who he is. <laughs> lee doesn't remember things it's yeah but he didn't have any dreads or beard as grey worm in the- i was confused by the killmonger hair star <laughs> yes yeah I, i'm going to come back to him in a second did you like him simon yeah yeah um we didn't really get to see much of him really did no. we so let's wait and see i, I think my only uh, i think my big impression of him at the moment is that he's acting to an empty room and i think a lot of actors struggle when they're acting to an empty room so i'm um, withholding judgment until we see him in a room with other people that he can interact with. Um, we got the girl, Claire, who comes up and recognises the Doctor before then realising that she's going to be blasted into the past by a weeping angel. Does this mean that she's met the Doctor more than once in the past and that she meets the Doctor in the past and then she meets the Doctor in the present and the Doctor says, why aren't you in the past? And then she meets the Doctor in the Doctor's past and the Doctor doesn't recognise who she is. This could either be one of these really sort of clever, for want of a better word, Stephen Moffat types paradox situations, or else it could be, because the impression I got initially was, oh, Chris Chibnall didn't understand what he did there because when she meets the Doctor in the past, it's in her future, so she'd have no memory of it. But I think it must turn out to be one step further on than that. But what I'm really asking is, did we enjoy the Weeping Angel scene? Yes, yeah. I thought it was very well done. And I, I think it's testament that I, st- I was still slightly freaked out by them. That 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 that's yeah, that scene was done really well because I was thinking, well, wow, you know, you'd think I'd be used to the Weeping Angels by now, but no, that was really quite intense. And how many so times? Still working. Have, how many times have we tried to get that key in the door when we were blind drunk? Which is basically the same kind of thing, isn't it? that she was doing that blind drunk acting although although what i will say is that in previous like in blink you feel like she's the person only blinks when they really have to she just kept looking away and it's like no don't look away because she obviously knew what to do didn't she yeah yeah she knew what it was she knew so why did what she was happening? Happening? keep yeah. looking away yeah. well yeah. yeah maybe she couldn't not blink and thought well if i'm gonna blink i might as well just see if i can get the key in the door quick and you know mm. you don't think you know we've not really had a weeping angel on our tail before side but i reckon i reckon we've do stupid not things really. as well no <laughs> yeah. i might i might sneeze and when you sneeze you you have to close your eyes you can't sneeze and not close your eyes so they've not had an episode of someone sneezing and getting taken by a weeping angel yet but be careful if you've got a cold that's all i can say matt what do you think of what do you think of the two main villains then, or the main villain and his sister, Swarm th- and Azure? I, yeah. I thought Vinda was fine, because thanks for asking. Well, um, I'm trying to I keep was, it moving around. I wasn't sure. I wasn't <laughs> sure about. I heard. I heard it suggested that <laughs> that Rose base was a reference to Rose, but I thought it was just because it looked like a rose. But I think they made it look like a rose because it was a reference to Rose. Possibly. Um, the main villains. Uh, yeah, I liked it. Voldemorty. I think they they were definitely going Voldemorty. It was a bit like Tim Shaw, but it worked better. I think the performance was a better, more. Is high- Voldemorty the best friend of Voldemort? Mm. Voldemort and Voldemorty. 
Um, so I liked, I was convinced by the kind of the, the weight of, of his character and by the fact that he seems to know the Doctor, but the Doctor doesn't know him. That's quite nice. Because again, anything that suggests the time there's children coming back in, I'm quite excited by because I really, really want that to have some sort of reason for being in the Chibnall stories. I want there to be some sort of payoff for that. Well, I don't think the payoff will be the timeless children. I think the payoff will be the division. So the payoff will be what the Doctor did after the timeless children. I think we've had the timeless children as much of that as we're going to get. But what we're going to get is what happens when the Doctor's part of the division. And as such about half a dozen times during the course of this episode, I was looking at characters and thinking, is that person going to turn out to be the Doctor? So when we first meet Azure, when she's called Anna, and she's with a companion in this house in the middle of the Arctic Circle, in the middle of nowhere, and they've got the guns and everything else, I'm thinking, oh, she's another Doctor, and they're on a mission from the Division, and then all of a sudden she turns out to be the bad guy. Well, but the bad guy is a prisoner of the division. So that makes me think he's got to be. Because the reason that they put the bad guy in this infinity prison, right? This prison is supposed to last for the whole of eternity. So he must have done something seriously bad if they're going to put him in an infinity prison. And the people who are imprisoning him are the Gallifreyans. They're the division. So he must have done something not just really bad, but something that the Gallifreyans consider really bad. So uh, as we stand, I think this has to turn out to be a Time Lord influence story. So it's not going to be just the Doctor or just the Division, but I think it's going to be Gallifrey as well. I might be completely wrong, but that's the impression I'm getting at this stage. Well, I'm pretty sure the, the lady that got, that got zapped by the Weeping Angel is some sort of, some kind of Gallifreyan. Because she do, she used the kind of the I'm getting back to to you the long way round, which is exactly what the doctor used think several times. Yeah, but I think that's as a result of what I said about her having met the doctor twice before and the doctor having ac accidentally told her yeah. what was going to happen to her. Yeah, but I I think she's still Gallif I think she's a maybe Gallif maybe maybe. Do you think we'll see her in the the Liverpool um, episode the, in the past? Yes. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. That's where she's gone, I'm pretty sure, yeah. yeah. I mean, could be anywhere. Could be in the Crimean War, but that relocates her to somewhere else on the planet. Is that where we are next week? Is it the Sontarans, by any chance? Mm -hmm. Lee, Lee, Since they are warlike creatures. Just guessing. <laughs> one, well, one the thing episode I have... Is... No... Sorry. Go on. <laughs> the episode is called War of the Sontarans. Is it? Okay. That gives it away. Mm. I was <laughs> going to say was uh, one thing about a swarm is that uh, teaching kids that it's not a good idea to eat one of those grow your own crystal kits. <laughs> oh, sorry, that was actually funny. Have you frozen? <laughs> <or are> you just... <laughs> no, it, what Simon said may have been funny. It was your reaction, Lee, that had nonplussed me and Matt. Okay, sorry about this, listeners. I just laugh. I don't know what the issue is. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I, don't know, I don't know how I feel about that makeup. There's something about it that I don't like. I don't is know it, what it is. It's there the dead makeup, isn't it? With a little bit of um, uh, hand of fear thrown in. It was very Hellraiser for a minute, and then it went very Tim Shaw. And the it's character very, reminded yeah. me of... It's very it's Voldemort. kind of the finish of it. I don't know. Well, Voldemort's the blankness, isn't it? Yeah, without this a nose. Is... So it's like a skull. Yeah, but this has got things poking out of the top of the head and the side of the head and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. I like, like that a bit. It's like his, there's a dent in his head. With... Yeah. Yeah. We'll have to, I, yeah, we'll have to wait and see how the character turns out. At the moment, he, he, he reminds me more of Tim Shaw than of anybody else. But who knows? By the end of it, he could turn out to be a, you know, one of the classic villains in Doctor Who. Yeah. What do we think then? Because I suppose the one more thing, and I want to talk a bit more about the division, maybe, and a couple of other things before we leave it. But the flux itself, because the flux is an event of some kind. And it's not been made explicit. Do we think the flux is something to do with Swarm? I suspect it has to be. Swarm seems to know what it is and where it's going to be. Uh, is it something that he's using as a kind of weapon to get his revenge on a 
on a universe that imprisoned him, something like that. I mean, none, none of this has been made explicit in the episode. And, none and it's of the, directional, isn't it? It's it's changing direction in order to follow attack the certain people. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, maybe it's an obvious clue, but as soon as that house shrunk, I thought, oh, is the master behind all this? So mm. um, I'm just wondering whether the master's sitting somewhere with an Atari joystick controlling the flux. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. Either that, Galactus has crashed into the wrong universe. Yeah, yeah but that's this true. Swarm, if this swarm was an infinity prisoner, whatever, for want of a better expression, an eternity prisoner, then that puts that character way beyond the master, doesn't it? That makes that he, character, yeah. We've got to work out what, what exactly the swarm's doing to these people, you know, because he's like, at one point he absorbs someone, doesn't he, when that first guard... Are these things being destroyed or are they being absorbed or turned into something else? Or, you know, is it time writing itself? It may not be a destructive thing. And it may be that, you know, the doctor ends up sort of saying, oh, no, let's just let it do what it wants to do because it's part of the process or something. The swarm, the swarm and the destruction of people. Um, not the swarm, I'll talk about the flux rather and the destruction. Yeah. They look the same. So. Yeah, it, sounds, it feels like it's probably a connection to the main villain. Um, well, we don't know yet, do we? Until we get there, what's happening with this? But what, but this I, what is good, I found isn't interesting, it? what I found interesting is that such a major event is happening in the first episode of Doctor Who, and we know that everything's got to have a reset switch because it's taken the moon out for a start, which is an egg, um, and all the rest of the solar system, which will blatantly affect Earth anyway. So if you take the moon away, we're wrecked because the tides will just kill us. So it's it's it, you know it can't happen. It can't happen. We can't have a a planet. I think if you take the sun <laughs> away, it's probably a bit more bad for us. Hasn't got there yet, is it? To the sun. I mean, if we're only at the ships at the moment, aren't we, in the story? It's only got to the ships. Well, that, that kind of presumes that the sun and the earth are on a two-dimensional plane. <laughs> <laughs> True that. Uh, yeah, so who knows? But anyway, yeah, that point taken there. But yeah, I think the idea that the flux is this unknown event that the Doctor didn't know, know about that turns up only after Swarm manages to escape from this infinity prison I don't know. It just seems that the two events, it would be very strange for them not to be connected, right? I'd, I'd quite like to see Jeff Bezos in his space penis getting sacked <laughs> by, the, by the swarm as he's <laughs> orbiting the Earth. And maybe Richard Branson just sort of follows him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, OK, one one last thing then, and we've probably done this already because we keep bringing it up. But the division, oh, like I say, I don't think we're going to see any more on where Jodie Whittaker's Doctor, or any of the Doctors rather, come from in a timeless children's sense. But we are obviously having the division. And I thought it was a nice point that she's going out of her way to look for information about the division too. Because remember when Peter Capaldi, we had one episode where he mentioned that he was looking for Gallifrey, but we never actually saw any evidence of him looking for Gallifrey. It was only because Missy said it. And I you know there were complaints that that was a, a storyline that should have been leaned into and never was here people could have made the same complaint about the division well surely if she's found out that this thing called the division exists and she was in it she should be looking for it and lo and behold she is and she's also keeping this a secret from yaz or she's keeping the idea that she's looking for information about the division a secret from yaz which i would suggest is perhaps because jodie whittaker that doctor doesn't know what she's going to find out, but suspects it might not be very nice stuff. And so wants to protect her relationship with Yaz, because if she knew, you know, if Yaz was aware that the doctor was looking for, for clues and for evidence that at one point she was in some ways a villain herself, Yaz might not be quite so enamored of her. So I think, think there's a lot of really interesting psychological stuff going on there too. I think Chris Chibnall sometimes doesn't get credit for some of the ideas he has in terms of the reality of his characters i think he's often better at doing realistic feeling characters than he is at doing science fiction say and i think actually in this episode he's managing to sort of knit those things together a bit better than we sometimes give him credit for so i i don't know 
that stuff all worked for me and it was good to see it. I was glad to see it. And I hope we find out not necessarily a lot more about the division, but certainly I hope we, I hope the division are a major part, at least of the last episode, if not throughout the rest of the series in one way or another. I don't know. What do any of you guys think, Matt? What do you, I mean, that's got to be good for you, right? If we assume that Binder is part of the division, which it looks like, because he's got the same designy costumes and stuff. He's a doctor. That means... That means they're definitely going. To, it's definitely going to be a part. I don't think he'll. I don't think he's going to be a doctor. This <laughs> this one because even even for a timeless children doctor, you'd expect him to have more sort of mobility and more kind of getting involved. But who knows? Yeah, um, who knows? But yeah, it'll be it'll be nice. And I still think there are timeless children questions that the doctor's looking for. So I don't. I think we've found an explanation for that, but not a reason for that. Yeah. And oh, I am. We haven't found a consequence of that. I think no, that's I what think I'm you're hoping right. for. Oh, no, I think you're right that those questions are open, but I don't think this series is going to answer those questions. That may get answered in the specials. Well, I don't think yeah. it will really there either. I mean, I'm, I assuming, this... I'm assuming this is going to be the flux. Obviously, this is the series where the flux gets answered. And then hopefully a few questions will be raised that can be adequately explained in the three specials that follow that lead to Jodie Whittaker's um, spoilers cat, for Lee sort of fountaining moment. Oh, Lee doesn't know that she's leaving. <laughs> <laughs> I do know that bit. Yeah. So we say Zinder. Zinder's actually the next Binder. doctor. Then. Lee Vinder. Vinder. Vinder is the next doctor. As in Graf Vinder. So like Chameleon Circuit turn human. Yeah, our friends going, let's pop the doctor out in the middle of nowhere, looking at the universe for the rest of his life because he's a pain in the neck and he's getting too involved. And now he's escaped and he's going to be involved. All yeah, that, except not? except I don't think they turn him human. I think he's Gallifrey. <clears throat> yeah, well, it's a chameleon circuit, isn't it? Do you know what? Arch? I think the, the cliffhanger... Arch, Arch, think... Arch, sorry, yeah. I think Whatever. the cliffhanger at the end of this episode, the universe is about to end. It's just been done so many times in Doctor Who before that I don't think that in itself is enough of a draw for people to come back. Do you remember the cliffhanger at the end of, um, not the Impossible Astronaut, the one that came after Day of the Moon? This character, out of nowhere, suddenly regenerates. Do you know what I think should have been the cliffhanger at the end of this episode? One of these dozens of characters that we've been following turns to the corner, sees a police box, pulls the key out of his or her pocket, opens the police box door and walks inside credits that would have been surely a more more of a reason to come back next week than the universe is about to end again <laughs> simon division what a, what a misery <laughs> um, i know i'm just saying i mean it worked there was a lot of tension there and they really ratcheted it up but i was hoping for somebody something a bit more metatextual the great thing about this story is it's leave, giving us so many questions. We're all chatting, and and it's not often we 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 get diverted by the story. Does that make sense? You know, it, it's like possibly myself and Lee, and Lee in particular loves talking about the story, and whereas you know the rest of us might get all bogged down in the production and all the stuff that's going on in the background and and all that stuff, um, and and it's making us talk about that. And we I think we're all invested. In a way, in in a, in a Jody story, in more ways than we have been before. So, I think it's really, really good. The division, as long as it's got nothing to do with Ed Sheeran, I'm I'm happy. It's all good. Um, so uh, yeah, so, and I, I I desperately want to make a joke about flying flux as well, but I can't think of one. You can't give us a flying flux. What? <laughs> Hey, but that's, With that's, an on, X, so that's on YouTube, isn't it? That's it gonna, is be, a now. Pro- that's gonna yeah. be problematic. <laughs> Why? It's it's um, I I wanted somebody to say bloody flux at some point. That's a it's a medi- medieval term for. Like, oh, only the people who've read your book would understand that. Joke. Uh, oh yeah, of course that was brilliant. That joke, Matt. I I admire that. Excellent. I'll send the yeah. tumbleweed through the post. I don't care. I'm not. Sp- I'm not making jokes for you guys. I'm making jokes for my fans on, on, on YouTube and all the listeners who have read my book and appreciate me. 
who don't uh, think I'm grey somehow. <laughs> I've read your book. Well done. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Lee, give Hello. this episode a score out of 10. I mean. Oh, wow, that's a jump. Okay. Um, yes, that was always going to happen. So here we was. are doing it. Right, let me just run through my head. There's a lot going on. I love all the strands that are happening. I, 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 everything was working. Everything's worked so far, apart from that very last couple of seconds with the end of the universe bit. I'm I'm utterly invested. I love it. I hope it keeps up its pace. I'm going to throw it a nine. I really loved it. Wow. I'm going to watch it in a minute again. Matrix. I'm I'm amazed at how quickly Lee ran through his head then. That and it was There's gone. not a lot of head. There's no. not a lot of head for it to get through. Extraordinary. I'm going to give it an eight. <laughs> and I'm going to give it an eight with the caveat that it might go up after six episodes or it might come down slightly after six episodes. But at the moment, I think it is solid. I think starting with the death of the universe is is actually an original thing. That's yes, normally what yeah. you find at the end of the season. Starting with it is quite exciting and should take you to new places. If it doesn't, then I'll be grumpy. If it does then, you know, it'll become a nine. Well, like I say, I think the story might be you start at the end and then you go back to before it happens and unravel how it happens. Mm. Maybe not literally, but I get. I think that might be the structure in some way. Anyway, Simon, out of 10. I, I was very tempted to do what Matt's just done and say, oh, it's, it's this mark and then maybe later it'll be different. But I think for the job it's doing and how it's setting up a six part story, I think it's done it incredibly well. Um, I've got some reservations that it wasn't as funny as it could have been, that some of the dialogue was was fairly weak um, and didn't really sing. Um, I didn't have a problem with the with the with the end either, really. I, I yeah, I know it, it, I had more of a problem with the fact that it's been said so many times before about all the universe's ending um than than how it was delivered really but but anyway i think it did it all incredibly well i was carried through it lifted me out of my bad mood which i'm extremely grateful for and uh in which case i'm going to give it a nine. Oh wow so i'm going to be the curmudgeon again because i'm giving it a seven because like i say I, there was a lot in this that i thought was really good but somehow i just enjoyed it slightly less than everybody else I think that's to do, and I don't lay this at the door of the director, but I just think there's something to do with the direction or the production that's sort of mostly holding me at arm's length from this version of Doctor Who. So it's not a complaint I can point at any one individual, but I just think there's something in the production that's just keeping me away from I do, really falling I do in love with it. honestly think it's Jodie's strongest episode. One more point before we go, the viewing figures... The overnight viewing figures have come out. They are, oh, was it 4.46? It was something, 4.4 something. Matt, are you okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, gone. Sorry. <laughs> well, that's it. The viewing figures, the overnights, they were higher than most of the episodes from the last season, higher than most of the episodes from Peter Capaldi's second and third season, not as high as the overnights overnights for Jodie Whittaker's first season that was when the viewing figures were really inflated after we had the first woman doctor and they stayed inflated for most of that season in other words the viewing figures are down but then viewing figures across the whole of television are down and actually Doctor Who this week depending on what the consolidated figure is at the end of seven days how many people watch on catch up the viewing figures as they stand could see Doctor Who well inside the top 10, possibly inside the top five. Either way, it's it's not a viewing figure that looks like a success. But actually, if you take it in context, it's a viewing figure that's actually very healthy. And also, having sold it as a, as a building six part single story, which they have done, I guess they are hoping that they're not mm. going to tail off and they might build as people become more invested in the story. Which is what happened with all three series of Broadchurch, actually. All three mm. series of Broadchurch kind of, the viewing figures went down a little bit in the middle, but then ended higher than they'd started. And so I suppose maybe they're hoping that will happen with this season of Doctor Who. I've got to be honest, I wouldn't predict that myself. But 
the overnights on the first episode of the season often tend to get inflated rather more across seven days because a lot more people tend to try the first episode out on iPlayer and then that number diminishes as well as the season goes on as people decide whether they like it or not. So, yeah, actually, this 4.4, whatever it was, is actually a really strong opening overnight viewing figure. We'll see how it goes. I don't suppose I don't suppose we'll talk about this week on week, but we may do because we're on video now and doing it slightly differently, I suppose. Right. We will be back next week once again on video, hopefully, to talk about War of the Santarans. Lee, did you close your ears? Never mind. <laughs> Until that happens, I was JR. I was Lee. I was Matt. And I was Simon. And we will speak again soon. <laughs>